Hello, and welcome to Ask the Doc. This is our monthly Facebook and YouTube live show where viewers have the opportunity to ask questions of experts in Alzheimer's and dementia research. My name is Dr. Megan Whitbrocht. I'm the Associate Director of Education at UCI Mind, which is part of a national network of Alzheimer's disease research centers, part <clears throat> designated by the National Institute on Aging, part of the National Institutes of Health. Today, we're gonna to talk about Parkinson's disease with the esteemed Dr. Claire Hinchcliffe, who is the Stanley Vandenort Professor and Chair of the Department of Neurology in the School of Medicine at UC Irvine. She received her Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Oxford in Molecular and Cell Biology and her med medical degree from Columbia University. Dr. Hinchcliffe completed her residency at New York Presbyterian Hospital and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in genetics at the University of Cambridge and UC Berkeley. Wow, that's a mouthful and quite a pedigree. Here at UCI, she is a practicing physician who specializes in movement disorders and a scientist who studies restorative approaches to treat Parkinson's disease. Welcome, Dr. Hinchcliffe. Thank you for joining us. Good. Hi, Megan. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here and uh, welcome to everyone who's joining us or everyone who's viewing at a, a later time. Thank you. And welcome to our viewers. If you're attending live on Facebook or YouTube, you can participate in the Q&A by typing questions in the comment box accompanying the video. Please do note that whatever you type lives on the internet forever, so please be responsible. Okay, I'm going to start things off with Dr. Henchcliffe. Dr. Hinchcliffe, can you tell us what Parkinson's disease is? Sure, okay, I can spend days and days on that, but I'll try to condense it. Um, Parkinson's disease has been traditionally defined as a movement disorder because that's kind of what you, what you see in people who are affected. Their movements change. Um, they can develop tremors, um, in coordination, slowing, and balance and walking problems can develop. And um, it kind of starts out very insidiously. So sometimes it's really hard to actually pinpoint when it comes on. Um, but as I've, I've alluded to, it does progress, you know, over time. And so um, that makes it very much like some of the other disorders that we talk about, like Alzheimer's, for example, starts off milder and then gets more severe as the years go by. And so over the years, it does get a lot more challenging to um, manage the symptoms and really maintain a good level of activity and, um, and life quality. And I'll just mention the way that we diagnose it is still a clinical diagnosis. So it's based on the information that a usually a neurologist is collecting and the neurological exam done in detail. Um, and of course, making sure there's nothing else masquerading as Parkinson's because there, there are those mimics. But over the past, let's say decade, um, we have more access to newer brain scans that specifically show the um, dopamine system in the brain. And I'll come back to dopamine later, but just for now, say it's reduced in, in particular areas in Parkinson's. And while the scans are not 100%, 100% accurate, I found them to be incredibly helpful in um, many circumstances. And then just last thing I wanted to mention, um, I focused on the movement side, but I think we, we, you know, it's also important to recognize there's so much to Parkinson's that you don't see that people are going through. Um, and I know we'll come back to some of those things, but I think it's hugely important to recognize if people are having difficulties with thought processing, for example, problems with memory, it can even develop into dementia. And so we really have to take care to recognize those things because as the years go by, they can actually impair and inhibit someone's activities more than the movement um, problems can. So um, I know it sounds pretty complex, um, but I just wanted to say, uh, la last comment on um, Parkinson's. Sounds complex. Not everyone gets all of these symptoms. So there are some people who are really going to get more of the movement and not get some of the other complications. It's really so variable and that's what makes it a challenge. Great. Now you had mentioned that Parkinson's disease can mimic other diseases. What are some other diseases that it mimics? Oh, goodness. There, there are even 
Um, some medications that will um, are, are antagonists of dopamine, for example, nausea medications, antipsychotic medications, they can make people appear Parkinsonian. Um, there are also other neurodegenerative disorders. And I'm thinking now of um, uh, disorders like multiple system atrophy or progressive supranuclear palsy. Um, people with those can also get the movement symptoms, then they can get other symptoms as well. So for example, in progressive supranuclear palsy, you might see movement symptoms that look like Parkinson's, but you might also get a particular sort of cognitive impairment. You also get problems with, um, uh, with eye movements. And then of course, we also know that in some disorders like frontotemporal dementia or Alzheimer's, or dementia with Lewy bodies, we can also see what looks like a um, movement signs that would look more like Parkinson's. And uh, you know, you never want to be fooled by um, uh, giving by by misdiagnosing, and it can be tricky at the beginning. And do we know what causes Parkinson's disease? Um, yeah, uh, no, <laughs> the short answer, yes, to uh, let's address the question. No, um, in the end, we don't, but we have a lot of good ideas. And um, it seems like the root cause seems to be a mix of genetic factors and environmental factors. They're, they probably, they really vary between different individuals. And either these factors alone or in combination, seem to alter various pathways, molecular pathways in the brain that trigger damage, for example, to the dopamine um, producing cells, but also to um, other types of cells. So, I mean, we can talk a, a little bit more about what some of those specific genes and, and risk factors are, but I just, um, I do want to bring up Something that's very um, uh, intensively on our minds in the field right now. Um, I said we think a lot about the types of environmental risk factors or the types of genetic risk factors that will push someone down a path of developing Parkinson's disease. But again, we think that they can be quite different in different people. So we know multiple different genes that can cause Parkinson's or increase its risk. There also seem to be a lot of different environmental factors. Um, everyone has their own different genetic background that is going to affect how all of that manifests. And so there's really um, a lot of interest right now in figuring out what's the individual brand, if you like, of, of someone's Parkinson's disease. Because I know when I see people in the clinic, one person is going to have a very different course than another. So we think that we're looking at a constellation of causes. They're probably overlapping, combined in different ways, but fundamentally coming down to genetic changes and environmental exposures. So one genetic profile might have a different phenotype than another genetic profile for Parkinson's? Is, am I understanding that right? You just, yeah, you, you just hit the nail on the head and people are really um, intensively researching um, how, how that works and what type of course could be um, associated with either a particular gene or a particular mutation within an individual gene. So there's this one gene, for example, called um, the, uh, it, it's, it's the GBA1 gene. Um, it uh, produces the glucocerebrosidase protein um, that has a number of really critical activities in the brain. And we know that particular mutations in the GBA gene can dramatically increase the risk of someone um, uh, developing Parkinson's disease. We also know there are some alleles that seem to be much more severe. So there's some particular mutations in that gene that are different from other mutations in the same gene um, and cause a much more, this is very, very sad actually, cause a much more aggressive cause and more predisposition to um, cognitive decline. So yeah, we, we also know other genes, for example, Parkin is something that tends to bring on um, Parkinson's in a much younger age group than, than uh, we generally see Parkinson's. Now, you mentioned dopamine a few times. Yeah. Can you tell us what dopamine is and how it's related to Parkinson's disease? Absolutely. Um, 
So uh, dopamine is a pretty simple little chemical structure. It turns out to be incredibly interesting as a neurotransmitter that helps nerve cells communicate. It's involved in a lot of different pathways in the brain. Um, my interest is its involvement in controlling movement. Um, so we know that we can have various areas of the cortex that will trigger pathways that are gonna make us move. But it's really the dopamine in the system in these very deep structures within the hemispheres of the brain called the um, striatum. Um, the dopamine actually helps you to modulate in a very complex way uh, those movements. So if there's loss of dopamine inputs in Parkinson's because of loss of those dopamine producing cells, you just lose that ability to coordinate. And the dopamine, um, it was figured out a, a little while ago, actually, that there's a couple of pathways that seem to be in balance in terms of controlling our movement and making sure we don't move too much or too little. And when you don't have enough dopamine in the system, the balance of those pathways alters. So with less dopamine means essentially less movement. And that's why people slow down. You know, I hear these complaints from um, people's family. Oh, he's not keeping up with us when we go on walks. Or, you know, someone is slow, taking three times as long to get ready in the morning. And that's the dopamine. Okay. We actually have a question in the, in the chat. And it was sort of leading to my next question about current therapies. Um, the question is, how promising are stem cell therapies? Oh, goodness. Um, so that's actually a major focus of my research. Um, there, this, this idea of um, transplanting dopamine cells or transplanting cells that eventually can grow into dopamine cells into the brain to replenish what's been lost, this is not a new concept. It's really been around for um, decades. And, um, you know, people had tried to do this back in the 1980s coming through to the 1990s and in the early 2000s there were actually a couple of clinical trials that were published trying to do cell trans to to um, provide cell transplants surgically transplanting um, tissues into the areas where the dopamine is missing and um, those provided some encouragement but i think looking back at what was done then there's, the barrier was always the types of cells that were available. We didn't have pure sources of dopamine cells. So, for example, it might be a mixed um, source of cells. So, uh, for example, from embryonic tissue, or it might be cells taken from the um, uh, retinal uh, pigment epithelium, or people who tried taking cells from the carotid body, which is in the carotid artery in the neck. And these were all really great rationales but just technologically very limited. And I think over the past couple of decades, people have figured out how to grow stem cells in pure and almost unlimited amounts in the lab. Not only that, but then to coax those cells towards becoming dopamine producing cells. So we're really in the situation now where we have cell sources available for transplant like we've never had before. You can manipulate the cells, you can give either unmatched cells, or you could provide people's own cells that have been developed in the lab. So the possibilities are there. Now, the next step is, is that safe? And so can we produce, can we transplant those cells and know that they're not going to cause a bad reaction? They're not going to overgrow. They're not going to cause tumors. And that's where the field is right now in terms of exploring um, safety, making sure we're not causing too many side effects. Um, and at the same time, looking at efficacy. And we can't say anything right now about how efficient these cells are going to be in terms of curing the movement symptoms. But we do know in the animal models, we know from preclinical work that there's a, a good a cause for optimism. So I'm going to say I'm very optimistic, but I want to put all the caveats around that, that this is slow. It needs really testing very um, carefully with great attention to safety. Are there any approved therapies to change the course of the disease, to slow it or stop it? Oh, goodness. Unfortunately, no. Um, and that's not for want of trying. So even when I trained, um, we uh, were just coming in the field out of a huge clinical trial, trying to look at whether a drug called selegiline could slow down progression of Parkinson's. 
And um, since then, I mean, there are so many, um, so many interventions that have been tried. We've tried supplements, we've tried different drugs, um, it, it, looking, you know, across the board at all sorts of different pathways. And unfortunately, none of them have ever come to fruition. So the will is still there. And um, it may be that the people who, who um, were in the clinical trials, maybe they're a little too heterogeneous. And maybe we need to look at specific, you know, Parkinson's coming from a specific process or Parkinson's coming from a specific gene to be able to um, get to that stage. So um, just to say, I think the, the optimism is still there, the will is still there, but this has not been, um, this has not been an easy course. On the other Back hand, we here. do have enormous number of, um, you know, growing number of um, medications that can take care of the symptoms. Can you talk a little bit about those uh, medications that treat symptoms? Yeah, so I'm going to come back to the famous, the dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. Um, it, well, I should say, going back several decades, um, carbidopa, levodopa has really turned into the gold standard for um, treating Parkinson's symptoms on the movement side. And levodopa is the one out of the two ingredients in that medication that does pass the blood brain barrier, get into the brain, um, stimulates the dopamine receptors. And when someone has a good response to um, levodopa, it's, it's just amazing. Sometimes we bring people into the clinics and see them off and on their levodopa. And um, at, at its best, it can be like night and day. So it can be a highly effective drug. Um, as time goes on, unfortunately, when people um, take the levodopa, they can build up a more complicated response to it. Um, so they can get these motor complications of therapy, meaning if the peak dose is a little too high, they can be moving too much, or the medication may not last as long as you really want it to. And so they'll go into a trough where all the Parkinson's symptoms come back. And that's kind of led to a lot of research and development to look at either longer acting drugs or drugs that would act in a, in a different way. And we have many, many options like that. Many of them work in the dopamine system, but there's been increasing attention to turning outside of the dopamine system and seeing are there other pathways that play into that that we could also modulate. And then, so along those lines, are there new investigational therapies exploring different pathways that you're excited about? Oh, goodness, yes. Um, so I think, the, the basic and translational research that's happened in the past few years has been amazing, past couple of decades, let's say. Um, we understand much more about what's happening in people's cells with Parkinson's disease, and that helps us to identify pathways where we can intervene, druggable targets. Um, one area that's really interesting, or, although it, it's this is quite complex, is the area of neuroinflammation. And I know that there, there are so many different disorders in which neuroinflammation is somehow involved. Some of the dementias, for example, but it's certainly a factor in Parkinson's disease. And um, so that's that's one potential pathway to look at. People are still looking at the dopamine pathway um, to see if we could deliver dopamine in a more natural kind of way to the brain. So the brain, brain likes to see a smooth delivery of dopamine. What it doesn't like so much is to get a hit of dopamine that then wears off and then another hit, and you know, kind of these ons and offs. So there's been um, some substantial progress there in terms of looking at different delivery systems for um, levodopa and other uh, dopamine related drugs. And then I, I think the other um, aspect of this is, you know, we haven't talked about the um, surgeries and certainly deep brain stimulation has been a standard of care for a long time. Um, but there are other surgical approaches now. I mentioned the um, stem cell based approach that relies on transplant, but people, a number of teams are looking at incredibly sophisticated possibilities for gene therapies. So, for example, um, taking people with a particular genetic cause of Parkinson's. So uh, one example is the GBA gene and then attempting to correct that genetic mutation that's leading to too little of the protein and giving back 
the correct gene, the um, normal gene, that can then produce what looks like the normal active glucose cerebrosidase protein. Um, and technologically, it's, it's, it's feasible, it's being done, it's being explored. So I think these are some of the really innovative um, changes that we, we have to watch out for. Can you talk briefly about the deep brain stimulation, what that is? Oh, absolutely. Um, this has been around for a couple of decades, I guess now. It was, when it was originally explored, um, it, it was originally approved uh, a long time ago for use in essential tremor, but we've now been using it to control, to help control the movement symptoms in Parkinson's for some time. And um, the typical people with Parkinson's who can benefit from this is when they've tried the medicine, the medicine has initially worked and then they're running into complications where the medicine is no longer holding them through the day and the quality of life and activity starts to suffer. So what deep brain stimulation can do is it can alter those movement networks in a different way through providing this kind of constant stimulation of electrical current. And of course, to do that, it means that there's a surgical implantation of very fine electrodes. The electrodes, um, they're really sophisticated. They're, they're, they're so um, slim. They can be programmed so that you can actually individualize the current that you're delivering to that patient to help um, target particular symptoms or to help target away from particular side effects that they might be experiencing. So these um, deep brain stimulation devices are, are getting much more sophisticated these days. But um, in terms of the practical aspect of it, um, it, it really is, um, it's, a, it's a surgery in which two small uh, burr holes are made, two small, it's almost always done on both sides, very rarely on one side. Um, two of these fine electrodes are inserted. And during the surgery, there's a lot of brain mapping that goes on to figure out, you know, which are, mm -hmm. what's, which are my best contacts and uh, what can we achieve using this type of stimulation? Um, and that really helps afterwards. But of course, it means indwelling electrodes. It means they connect to a little battery, usually in the chest, sometimes in the abdomen. And um, that can be reprogrammed, so there's some flexibility there. But of course, there's that indwelling, um, indwelling hardware. But it's it's a game changer for so many patients. It really is. It it was an amazing um, step forward. Good. We have a question in the in the chat, and it was sort of uh, about levodopa. Is levodopa toxic when taken for many years? Oh goodness, that's a great question. Um, my mentor was Stan Fahn, and he actually was concerned about that. This is years ago. He um, put together a really great clinical trial to try to see what would happen if you um, treat people with levodopa at various different doses versus not. So he took people with pretty early Parkinson's disease to do this. And then, of course, you knew that the levodopa would help the symptoms. So that wasn't really the question. The question was, what happens when you take people off it? And if it was damaging and toxic, the idea was that people who'd taken it, particularly at the higher levels, once they came off it, the idea was that they'd be doing so much worse than the people who'd never taken it. And in fact, that turned out not to be the case. Um, there was even a question for a while about was it was it um, actually protective as opposed to deleterious? So we do not have evidence that levodopa itself is is toxic to the cells. But I think that who, whoever put this question in, this is really a great question. It's very subtle because what does happen is that as people who have taken levodopa over the years, as I mentioned, the response changes somewhat. So rather than lasting for several hours, the response could get down to three hours or two hours or even a little bit less. And we find that the, the risks for that are linked to higher doses of levodopa, longer times of taking it. So it's not toxic, but it's changing something in the system. It's changing something in the response. Now, I wanted to go back to one thing you had mentioned about gene therapy and, and sort of that exciting new um, uh, yeah, that it's really exciting. Um, 
Can you tell me where we are in the process? At what phase of clinical trials we are? How close could we be to seeing um, these gene therapies approved and being used in the clinic? Yeah, that's um, a, another great question. It depends on the gene therapy. So um, for this more recent idea, which is trying to provide a, a precision medicine approach, right, of taking people with a particular genetic mutation and attempting to correct that, that's in very early days. That's Those are really early phase trials, like a, a, I think it's a phase one slash two, but very early and really focused on looking at safety and tolerability. Um, there are other gene therapies that have gone further than that. So I'll just mention a, a, a couple um, where they've actually under, undergone um, at least two rounds of testing. So the first gene therapy, as far as I'm aware, um, is actually the surgeon, uh, Mike Caplet, who I worked with in New York City. And um, what he did was really innovative. And he said, rather than try to do something rather than try to augment the dopamine he actually tried to modulate a network by um, decreasing activity of one area of cells that were kind of hyperactive and he said these are hyperactive in parkinson's they're they're actually having an adverse impact on movement if we can turn down their activity however we do it um, we may be able to help people with Parkinson's. And it's actually one of the targets that they use for deep brain stimulation. So there's some relation wow. there. And what he did was he, he introduced a, a gene to um, decrease the, um, uh, the excitatory outputs, decrease the outputs from this hyperactive nucleus of cells. And they did actually find some degree of benefit. It, it wasn't a huge degree of benefit. And so um, more, th there's still some testing that remains to be done. So we're, we're not yet at the point of having that close to approval, but it did go through a phase two trial, um, which means essentially testing it in comparison with placebo, which usually in these cases is a sham, it's a sham surgery. It's when you think you've had the surgery and you really haven't. Mm. So they did get to that point and they could show that it modulated the networks in the brain. Again, they, they found some degree of benefit. So that's one example. And then there are other examples of people who've taken the approach of using gene therapy to try to augment our, our brain, to try to kind of get our, our brains to make more dopamine, even in cells that wouldn't normally be doing that by delivering genes that are necessary to make dopamine. And again, some, some of those have gone through more than one round of testing. There's also been attempts to look at how could we protect the brain cells or restore their function using um, these little protein factors called neurotrophic factors, which are protective. So uh, for example, GDNF is one, um, the name doesn't matter, but the principle is that it can protect the cells. Um, and uh, that is um, currently in testing. Um, so, you know, this is slow. It takes years to kind of get to the point of establishing how beneficial these may be, and also establishing that they may have benefit, but you know we can't give them if if they're too dangerous. So, get, getting the data on the balance of the pros and cons of these types of approaches takes a while. But my goodness, um, it it seems like there's a really rich pipeline right now. That's good. That's exciting. Yeah. Well, we're gonna have to have you back to talk about your research. I didn't even get a chance to ask you about the type of things that you're doing in your lab. Um, we're gonna have to wrap it up. Thank you, Dr. Henchcliffe, it was a pleasure. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. Um, and yes, please, please come back. Thanks, Megan. Um, thanks for having me. And uh, I just wanna um, say what an amazing job I think you're doing and UCI Mind in this educational series is really awesome. So thanks for including me. Absolutely, please, please come back. <laughs> and thank you to all of those who attended today. You can access this and past Ask the Doc episode pod, um, episodes, plus our podcasts, and more on our YouTube channel and at our website at mind.uci.edu slash mindcast. Please join us in 2022 for a whole new lineup of exciting guests. To learn more about research at UCI Mind, you can visit our website or consider signing up for the UCI
consent to contact registry. Signing up at C2C is free, confidential, and allows you to be matched with research studies all over UC Irvine. Take care, and we'll see you soon for the next Ask the Doc on Mindcast. Thank you.